Detroit Business Hub Group Director Nancy O'Neill works with her team of experts. Listen to conversations with business professionals to discover the latest business innovations, insights, and trends. Find out what's hot and what's not in today's business market. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being on the show with us today. We have an esteemed guest. His name is Marcus Jackson. He's the communications manager for CIBC Bank, or uh, is it Bank or Credit Union? <laughs> no, it's a bank. It's, it's a bank. Okay, okay. I'm making sure. I want to make sure I had say it correctly. Mm-hmm. Okay, and Marcus is part of our DBHG lecture series. So he's going to be our, our keynote speaker in December. So I'm going to go ahead and allow Marcus to introduce himself. Thank you, Nancy. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Marcus Jackson. I work for CIBC Bank. Um, my, my actual title is Community Development Relationship Manager. Um, and within in this role, I help small businesses get loans, essentially. So uh, I started in banking about uh, oh, oof, nine years ago. Wow. Um, right, right out of college, I uh, graduated from Western Michigan University. So go Broncos. All um, right, Broncos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And um, I started in PNC's management training program. Uh, that's where I was credit trained uh, and started out in their business banking uh, cohort. And was after graduating from that program, I was promoted to a business banking officer. Then I made the transition to CIBC Bank for what I'm doing now. Um, and for what I'm doing, I'm helping small businesses obtain loans. And we have three buckets. So as long as the small business is located or is located in Oakland, Wayne, and Macomb County. Uh, the business is a majority minority a business that's a million and under in annual sales and or located in a uh, low to moderate income area. As long as you fit one of those buckets, you could potentially qualify for one of our loans. Okay. Yeah. So all right, what are some of the other roles that you play uh, in your community relations manager position? Uh, so in this role, I uh, serve on a couple boards, one of them being the National Entrepreneurs Association, the treasurer, I was the former treasurer of the Wayne County CRA Association. I'm now just a general member. Um, I was treasurer for about three years uh, for that role. So that's why I, I stepped down and then just doing things like this, being an advocate for the community, for the small business community in Southeast Michigan. So talking on panels, conferences, uh, even in some cases, even speaking at some financial classes to educate uh, small business owners. Okay, great. Well, if you're interested, we do offer teachable courses. So if you're interested in teaching a course for, for us, we would love that. What are some of the topics that you teach in these in your small business courses? Um, well, typically it's the organization's uh, curriculum, or sometimes like I do junior achievement, so they have their own curriculum laid out where I'm teaching those principles. But more or less, I talk about the importance of business credit, establishing a business relationship or banking relationship for your business, and uh, just good or best practices for businesses when it comes to banking in general. Okay, great. Um, So speaking of your minority business loans, what are some of the product lines currently available at CIBC to help minority business owners? So we have a couple of programs, one of them being the entrepreneurship training program. And that program, as long as you have to graduate from one of our partner programs, we have uh, seven in the market. Um, Once you graduate from one of those programs, the day after you graduate, you have to have a minimum credit score of 600 or higher. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have a means to pay back the loan and and as long as you meet those requirements, you can be more than likely to give you a loan anywhere from one thousand all the way up to ten thousand dollars. Did you say up to two thousand dollars? No, from one thousand up to ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars. Okay, okay. I want to make sure I was hearing you correctly. Yep. And that's for uh, that was created for a true startup. So you find a startup is anywhere from zero to twelve months. So after that, oh, sorry, go ahead. is this mostly when well, you said zero to 12 months? So this is mostly for startup businesses. 
it's for it was geared towards startup businesses, but you don't have to be a startup business to qualify for that loan. As long as you graduate from, from one of our partner programs, you could potentially qualify for that loan. Okay, so who are some of your partners um, for when you say programs? Um, what are some of the partners that you have that a potential client would have to graduate from? So that would be Build Institute, the Osborne Business Association. Michigan Coming Forward, Best Practices Consulting LLC, QT Business Solutions, um, oh, this one, oh, oh, uh, Tech Towns Retail Bootcamp. Oh, yeah. Y'all yeah. familiar with many of those? Yeah, so many, many, many of them, if you graduate from just one, you have to go through all of them, or just one, you could potentially qualify for uh, the entrepreneurship training program. We call it ETP for short. Okay, so based on graduate from one of these programs and meeting your other criteria, someone would be eligible, a business owner would be eligible to receive a $1,000 to $10,000 loan, correct? Correct, yep. For that, that's a term loan and or a line of credit. Okay, wonderful. That's good to know. And, um, and, then, oh, and then after that, we have our um, Easy Path loan, which with the Easy Path loan, it's a suite of products, it's a term loan and line of credit. The business has to be located in a low to moderate income area, and you have to be in business for at least a year. The credit score is also 600 as well. Um, and then you have to have a global cash flow of one to one, so a break even. So as long as you meet those qualifications, you could potentially qualify for a loan, or loan, a line of credit or term loan from 1,000 up to $25,000. Okay, wonderful. So um, that was actually your segue right into my next question. Um, what are some of the obstacles that minority business owners face when applying for these loans? And I'm assuming that the credit score is a huge obstacle. Um, what do you do for someone who needs to restore credit or get up to that 600 credit score? Even though I feel like a 600 credit score is pretty reasonable. It's not like you know, that's lower than um, most banks would want you to have to obtain a credit card or line of credit. So I feel like 600 is pretty fair. Yep. Um, so we have, uh, it's actually called a step loan. So an easy path step loan. And with that, it's not business credit score. It's not driven by the personal credit score. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, it was established to help you establish business credit in the business name. So essentially, you could make a small payment um, monthly, and then after doing that for a year, your payments go into a CD, they accrue interest, and then after that year, you've established business credit in the business name. Hopefully, by then, you've been, been able to raise your personal credit score to 600 or higher, mm -hmm. and you've also established a relationship with us. And the beauty of it is, after that year, you get all of your money back, plus the interest accrued, and even if you are a startup, you've been in business for at least a year. So you could potentially qualify for our easy path, um, regular term on a line of credit. Okay. Yeah. So you think just in that one year that someone can't raise their credit score up high enough with that one program mm -hmm. to qualify at the 600 credit score or higher? Yeah, because with this one, we now we do pull your personal credit to see where you're at. However, it's this is building business credit. So for building your personal credit, we would recommend uh, going to see a true financial counselor to do that. Because what I what I handle is just specifically business. So but we have a lot of relationships or partnerships uh, with a lot of good agencies that can help. So I would recommend a list of people that they can check out to help with their personal credit as they're building their business credit, because it's important to build your business credit. Right, right. And so the 600 credit score, though, that is based on your personal yep, credit that is, score. That's right? based okay. on your personal credit score. That is a hard line that we have. Also, I, I failed to mention, we do have one other product. It's called the Community Plus product. The okay. Community Plus product goes from 1000 all the way up to 100000 Um, And that's for a term loan or line of credit. Um, now, for that one, because that's more of a business banking product, uh, that was fit for small businesses. Uh, those have the better rates. So currently we have a promotion going for prime plus zero for a line of credit. And then for the term loan, a line of credit, one to uh, three years at 5.75% and 
okay. four to five years, uh, four to five years at six point seven five percent. Now, currently with the promotion with the Community Plus, uh, there's currently no fees on the loans. So that's obviously subject to change, but as of now, there's no fees whatsoever on the loans. That you, you just pay what you want. So, and again, this this is the reason why these products were created was to help small businesses. And we're keeping them in mind. Okay. All right. And then if business owners are interested, how would they contact you if they're interested in obtaining any of these loans? Yeah, they would just, you can give me a call on my uh, office phone. It's 248-566-4705. Uh, uh, or they can always email me at Marcus, M-A-R-C-U-S, Jackson at CIBC.com. Okay, great. Um, so let's segue into how we met. I actually met you through Kimley Naylor, who is going to be our keynote speaker next Friday mm -hmm. at 6 p.m. at NQB's on Ferndale. Uh, and um, I told her I was looking for someone in financial services, and she recommended you to finish up our um, our DVHG lecture series. So tell me how you and Kim Lee met. So we met at a networking event at the Osborne Business Association. Um, and we and this was actually my first year working at CIBC. Um, okay. We, had, we developed this uh, working relationship and we've been in contact ever since. So um, I've, you know, she's asked me to speak at one of her contracting events or event that she had. I spoke about a couple years ago and um, she's a great contact and uh, it's just been a great relationship. Okay, great, great. And you also attended one of our events recently, the Shannon Steele event back on January 22nd. Mm -hmm. um, tell us why it's important for someone who's especially starting new in the business, whether it's real estate or financial services or a different aspect of sales. Why is it important to network in person? It's good to network in person because you never know who's in the room. Mm -hmm. you, you you never know what's going to happen. I can, I've been with CIBC for a little over four years and believe it or not, I still get calls from people that I met uh, when I first started or people that I recently, I got a call from a, a potential client who I met in 2019 and they remembered, uh, <laughs> they, they remembered me speaking to them at the event. <laughs> And they're asking me for a loan or uh, another lady that I met in 2018 and she couldn't find my card. And she saw that I was speaking at something virtually and she was able to get my contact information. So the impression that you can leave on people, it can come mm -hmm. back years later. Yeah, that's wonderful. I was going to ask if these um, individuals that you're speaking of, they keep your card or not or how what happens if they lose the card. Because a lot of times with uh, in-person networking events, people lose your contact information. Yeah, I. It's funny. I was uh, cl I was cleaning my dresser and I found fifty cards on my. Oh dresser. my goodness! Yes, yeah, <laughs> a lot. All, all, all from last year. I'm just like, <laughs> I probably have more scattered throughout my office. So it's it's a good it's a good thing to keep them because you never know. You never know right. who, who you're who you may need or uh, who you need to call. Yeah, business cards are helpful. Now, do you believe, um, you know, that there's some networking gurus that say if you give someone your card, you should expect a card from them in return? How do you feel about that with you being in kind of customer service or customer relations? Because you might meet someone who doesn't it isn't necessarily a business owner. They might not have a business card. Um. Well, it's I, I give them my card or if they don't have any information, I'll say, hey, Here's my card. Write your information on the back of my card so I can mm -hmm. get in contact with you. Um, I, I try my best to always have enough cards on me to be prepared for any type of situation. OK, now at these events that you're speaking at, are you a vendor as well? Like, are you um, like, do you have like a display table where you're collecting names and phone numbers? Because I found that's a really good way to build your database. Um, so it's. So at some events uh, where we do have a table, mm -hmm. not necessarily don't have a, a sign-in sheet or anything like that. Um, but I definitely I keep all the cards that I have that day, and with I try to do within 24, but at least 48 hours, email everyone that I've gotten in contact with. Um, okay. So. Do you give anything away? Do you give away freebies, <laughs> pens, pencils? Uh, free, oh, people free. like that kind of stuff. 
Yeah, pre <laughs> pre COVID we did. So we would oh, have yeah. uh, chip clips, um, yeah, chip clips, pens, uh, headphones, like little earbud head headphones, uh, hand sanitizer spray, um, the the thing you put on the back of your phone. I don't know the name of that, but. Where you can hold all your cards. Yeah, I know uh, what you're referring to. I don't know that. Sorry, I can't help you out on that one. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, the, the big hit is we have the backpacks, the CIBC backpacks. That's that's always a huge hit. The, the drawstring backpacks. Okay, let's talk about the climate and trends in the marketplace right now. Mm -hmm. Is this a good time for people to borrow? Because um, you know, like any other bank, they uh, lenders want to find out how they're going to get their money back. Are people that you see coming to you in business, are they actually making a profit or like you said, breaking even? What are some of the trends that you're currently seeing in the marketplace? Um, so obviously since we're, we're still not out of COVID, COVID but um, there's been businesses that have been severely hurt and then there's been some businesses that are doing extremely well because we're able to pivot. Um, and then there's some that been hurt but then bounce back. So I'm kind of seeing a mixture of everything. Um, it's, it varies industry to industry and depending on what they did. Um, some of the hardest hit industries would clearly be retail industries or in restaurants. They're some of the most hardly hit, but like okay. cleaning, service, cleaning services, this is booming for them. So mm -hmm. it kind of just depends on what they're doing and where they're at. But with that being said, now, CIBC and all banks are still open to doing loans, and I'm still am doing loans. Um, so, uh, with that said, those that hurt, they're still showing a profit, just maybe not as much pre COVID. Okay. So, in other words, you're saying this is a good time mm -hmm. to start a business. Do you think that people should be pivoting depending on what's selling right now in the marketplace before they just launch out and start something due to the current climate? Um, well, my, my personal opinion, not on behalf of the bank, but my personal opinion is that if you're going to do go into something, one, you want to make sure you have a passion for it. And two, you want to make sure you understand it because you don't want to get into something that you don't understand, that you don't have a passion for because the business is likely to fail. Something that I tell business owners all the time is no one's going to love your business as much as you. That's definitely true. It's your baby. <laughs> it's, your, it's your baby and no 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 one else is gonna love it as much as you. I can love the idea. You know, I I can love Krispy Kreme, but the <laughs> owner of Krispy Kreme needs to love it more than I do, you know. Plus I can't eat there all the time because I, I Oh my goodness. <laughs> Don't start with Krispy Kreme. Yeah. Every so, time I drive by there, I'm like, I just like try to, I'm like, I'm gonna pass it, I'm gonna pass it, I'm gonna pass it. I did go in there for um, St. Patty's Day, though, and I got a, um, a leprechaun donut, a green donut with chocolate frosting. That sounds delicious. <laughs> I, I, ju I just found out I live by a crisp, another Krispy Kreme, and I, pat I looked at it yesterday, and the red light was on. I said, no, Marcus, don't it. It smells so good, too, when you pass the building. Oh, man. Speaking of um, donuts, have you been to Dutch Girl Donuts on Seven Mile yet? Of course, of course. <laughs> Got to. I, I remember a couple years ago, I I saw, I think it was Fox 2 Detroit. They were doing a, a special. I was like the third, it was passed on to the third generation. And it was a <laughs> night I couldn't sleep. And I saw it at like two in the morning. And I stayed up. To oh no! You and had I, to go to Dutch Girl. <laughs> I drove there and I bought, I bought two dozen donuts. Oh my goodness! And I Please bought, tell me you didn't eat all the donuts. No, no, no. So I oh, bought good. two dozen and I dropped. I called my dad. He was on his way to work. And I said, Dad, I got some donuts. He's like, I'm on the way. They'll be, they'll be at the house. It's fine. I'll leave them with mom. And uh, dropped them off to my sister. And I just happened to be off that day. And so I. I took the rest home and, you know, ate on my patio with my Dutch girl donuts. I was very happy. It's a great day. <laughs> it's a great day. It's a great day. Yeah, I love Dutch girl, too. I got introduced from my job and I was like, oh, these are some good donuts. The um, the cinnamon, let me see, the cinnamon sugar donuts, they are so good. Like the cake donuts. 
Mm-hmm. So I went there one, like, I think it was a Friday afternoon or Saturday afternoon. I'm like, okay, I want my cinnamon sugar donuts. It's like, oh, those sell out at like 7 a.m. I'm going, 7 a.m.? I mean, not that they go on the shelf. They're sold out <laughs> for the day at 7 a.m. Mind you, I went at like 6 a.m. or 6.30. Right. There was a line wrapped around the shelf. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't like, you know, I was the only one there. I was like, man. Just, I, I never went that early. And for me, I'm, I'm a big kid. I love sprinkles on it. So that, mm-hmm. that's typically my go-to. But um, there, they, there was a lot missing. When I went. But they were back there making them. So. Yeah, so when you talk about, like, um, well, I bring up scaling. So Dutch Girl is a really good example because they only really have that one location that I know about. Yeah. I mean, at what point do you think a business should expand um, or develop an expansion plan, um, which most of the time does entail um, more upfront costs mm-hmm. and or marketing? So for Dutch Girl, for example, if it has been in business three generations, which I wasn't aware of, I mean, do you think that they should relocate to a larger facility, scale, open up additional um, stores? What's your opinion about that? I mean, from my personal opinion, it's, I guess, the age old saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Um, and, it, and it just depends on the business owner, the, the, mm-hmm. the, whoever owns it now. They, they may just be comfortable where it's at. Um, so they may have no desire. If you're going to expand, that can be a headache because you have to factor in labor. You have to factor in mm-hmm. all the overhead that comes with that. And Yeah, location. And, if you're going to expand, you want to make sure that you are properly set up to do that. I mean, Chris, speaking of Krispy Kreme, that's a prime example. They expanded and then they had to close a lot of them because they weren't necessarily ready. Mm-hmm. So you want to make sure that if you are going to expand, that you understand the costs that come with that, the the overhead that you can truly manage that. Right. Otherwise, you can expand and work yourself out of business. Yeah, that's true. I'm not necessarily saying, like necessarily saying on a Krispy Kreme scale because well, you yeah. think that they could hire anybody they wanted to, you know, all the experts that could go over, you know, yeah. the demographics and location and all of that. I have, I have no doubt that they could go. They could go to every neighborhood in the city and probably be just as successful. I, I, have, I have no doubt because uh, right. they're. They're 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 not that great. Uh, it's just you want to make sure. I guess even thinking back to our partners, right? Having a business plan, it kind of goes back to that. You need to have a vision for your business, uh, right? And right. but also understanding that your business plan can change. So like I talked about before, how some businesses were able to pivot. Sometimes you need to do that. There was a client that I had uh, before and. They were a manufacturer, they were making a product, and there was a byproduct that came from making a specific, uh, specific product. And what they found out was by selling the byproduct, they could make more money than what they were making by their actual product. So mm-hmm. they pivoted and they doubled their sales by mm-hmm. pivoting to making the byproduct. And now that's something that wasn't originally in their business plan, but it just goes to show, you know, you want to make a plan, you want to have a vision, and you always want to think ahead and have some foresight. Yeah, and, and you know, when you talk about the business, depending on the business owner, I agree with you, but I think part of it, too, is the customers, because you and I, like I, like I said, I think I went, I think it was a Saturday afternoon, that I went to Dutch Girl. So it's not going to be as busy as like a weekday morning when people are on their way to work. But you can have customers, hey, in Detroit in the middle of the winter, nobody wants to wait outside. I mean, as good as Dutch Girl donuts are, or as excellent as they are, nobody wants to wait 15 or 20 minutes out in the snow or the cold to mm-hmm. get a donut and a cup of coffee. So that just is an example of you've got the customers in place, but the location, you know, in my humble opinion, is a little bit too small. The customers can't really wait because, you know, there's not enough space to wait inside of the establishment. So to me, that's an example. Hey, if I was a business owner, I might need to think about expansion because I don't want to lose my customer base. I mean, that's I feel like it's a a symbiotic 
symbiotic relationship between the business owner, the employees and the customers and not just the business owner. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and that's something even in banking, that's something you consider if you moved your business to a different location, would your customers follow? Oh, that's, yeah. It's important if you are going to um, have a brick and mortar business, you want to make sure that whatever neighborhood that you're in, that they support you. You, it's it's right. it's a good idea to do pop ups and you know, survey the neighborhood. Make sure that they know uh, that you're there and that they can support you because you want that support. And and Dutch Girl Donuts, anyone that's from Detroit or the Metro Detroit area, you more than likely know who Dutch what Dutch Girl Donuts is. Now, mind you, I went. I think it was a Thursday in July, <laughs> not when I went. So and because I happened to be off, it made sense for me. But like you said, diff- different times and even the seasons. Yeah, I, I, I won't go if if I if I'm driving to something downtown, um, and I'm taking Woodward. I'm not, and I see there's a long line. I'm probably not going to stop. If exactly. There, if there was a drive-through, maybe. But then at the same time, if the drive-through's packed, I might not either. So I mean, you can't yeah. always make everyone happy, but ultimately, you got to do what's best for your business and listening to your customers and something. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So all of those things, you know, have to be taken into account. Um, So we talked about scaling. We talked about opening a new business. Do you have some people that um, ever come to you for counseling? Like once they maybe they got they were able to obtain a loan and Mm -hmm. things aren't going as well as they would like. Is that part of your role, too? Or do you um, refer them to someone else to say, hey, I got this loan. My business is struggling. They're coming to you for help or advice. What do you say, or where do you direct so, them at that point? So, from a banking perspective, if you are struggling, I just want to make this explicitly clear: if you are struggling, talk to your banker because mm-hmm. your banker can help. We, we can restructure, make, potentially restructure the deal, do something because we want to help. Right? That's why mm-hmm. we're these roles. We want to make sure that we're actually helping, not hurting. If it's something within my power that I can help with, then yes, I'll try to give whatever advice I can. If it's something beyond my scope, um, like for example, if they went through a partner program, um, I would refer them to a couple people that within, either within that program or even outside of that, that could help them with specifically with what they need. Because it's uh, it takes a team, right, to help. And so from the financial side, I can help you with that. But if you're asking me about your taxes, I'm not your tax guy. Right. <laughs> I, matter of fact, I actually hate accounting. So I would refer, I would refer you to, you know, your an accountant. Or if you don't have an accountant, there's plenty of people we can refer you to. Accounting aid, if you're in the state of Detroit, for example, is a good one. Um, mm-hmm. But there's there's lots of resources out here for tons of things, and that's the beauty of having a relationship with a banker is that if we don't know the answer. We at least know someone, or we can point you in the right direction to get the answer that you're looking for. Okay. And you had also mentioned a uh, business plan. Um, mm-hmm. I know that you have about seven partners that you're working with. Do you also, also require a business plan, or do you assume because they went through one of the, your um, supported programs that that's something that they, your programs would have walked them through already? So that was part of the reason why we have those programs. So when you graduate, mm-hmm. you have to have a business pro, uh, business plan through those programs. Okay. okay. And and they and they help you do that. Now we only require the business plan for true startups. Um, but beyond that, I'm still an advocate of having a business plan because again, you want to have your vision written out. And mm-hmm. You're more likely to accomplish your goal or vision once you have it written out. Right. Right. Plus, it's interesting to see where you go. I mean, there was a um, a lady I know uh, where I met at a networking event, and she kept her business plan from 30 years ago. Oh, my goodness. And it was a salon that she wanted to open. And this woman had seven salons over 30 years. So it was just like being able to see she's that habit. So I, I wanted to see where I would go. It's like, how different is your business plan from 30 years ago? And then as a salon owner, how different is the climate? How, how has salons changed from 30 years ago to today? Right, of course. 
uh, it, it's when you have things like that, it's it's a good benchmark for you and your business. Right, right. So you are going to be attending the Kimberly Naylor event next Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that you, like we said before, you already know Kimberly Naylor. Um, what are you hoping to gain out of the program or the event next Friday? I know that you um, you've been to at least one of our events already. Mm-hmm. Talk about the atmosphere. Why would it be so important for um, new business owners or maybe even some of your current clients or former clients to attend an event like this? Uh, well, again, it's about gaining uh, knowledge and information and networking. So one thing that people ask me in my role all the time is, uh, what, do, what do small business owners need or what do minority business owners need? And most of the time we hear it's uh, access to capital. Our access to capital is is true. I'm not saying it's right. not. It really is true. My personal opinion is knowledge. Mm-hmm. I personally feel that for a lot of people, if they knew better, they would do better. And mm-hmm. a lot of business owners, they, they don't know what you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. And if, you don't, if you don't know the resources that are available to you that can help you succeed, I can't, I can't blame you for that. And so the onus is on us who have that information and know those resources to make sure that we share them with others so that we can build a successful and sustainable community for business owners. So I would say I'd recommend to go specifically just to gain knowledge um, and to network because again, you never know who you're gonna bump into. You could bump into someone, another business owner that you can partner with that can help launch both of your businesses or a key contact that you may need to launch your business or whatever it may be. And again, you don't, you may not need them now, but you may need them a year or two later. I, I kept a business card of, one of those 50, I kept a business card of someone from two years ago and I just know them up there. I'm caught up every, uh, having a Zoom meeting next week. You never know. You, you exactly. Never know. Yeah, and the other thing I would say that a lot of new business owners need is customers. So mm-hmm. <laughs> customers are the <laughs> lifeline of your business. You got to keep that sales, sales funnel full. And that starts with, you know, prospects and talking to people and getting people interested in your business. I mean, you have to have probably, you know, 500 prospects to to get at least half of those as leads and then maybe a quarter of the leads to turn into actual sales. So you yeah. have to admit, I think the larger your prospect base is, the more opportunity you have for success. It's a numbers game. It's like, uh, it is, yeah. You know, when, I, when I started on banking and I had to do cold calling, it's like for every 10 calls, expect one sale. Mm-hmm. Right? And so it's That's actually like, a pretty good ratio for talking on the phone. Yeah, right. So, you know, and I and for for me, yeah, that pretty much was it. out of every ten calls, I had about one set. But it's a numbers game. So that means I have to make if I do a hundred calls, I'm gonna get ten sales. But right. then you have to make sure that out of those ten sales, you say, Hey, can you refer me to others? Because a warm lead is a lot better than a cold. Absolutely. Yeah. You want to get to those warm leads, which is another reason why you want to come out to these events. So Kimberly's going to be talking about construction and um, housing and equality and social advocacy, um, dealing with housing. So Mm -hmm. even if you're not, say, like a realtor or, you know, a financial advisor, but if you're somewhere, if you offer services, potentially offer services to those uh, types of clients, potential clients, or mm-hmm. you would like to kind of expand your prospect base, I mean, this would be a good opportunity for you to be able to meet like-minded people. So um, some people are a little closed-minded. They're like, well, they're not, it's not like a trade, a specific trade organization for one industry, which is true. But I tell people all the time, like, you know, I've been a part of, you know, real estate boards and um, insurance trade uh, industry organizations. And you can't sell insurance to another insurance agent. So it's like sometimes you have to get outside of your circle and mix and mingle to be able to, um, you know, solicit prospects and get potentially get new clients. You kind of have to mix it up a little bit sometimes. Absolutely. And then again, you you don't know who they know. Exactly. So- you know, I could, you know, I, I could help. I, who, my network is, you know, you don't know who I know. So you may be selling insurance. No, I may not need insurance, but I may know five people who need insurance. And because exactly. I've met you and I love your products, I can say, hey, guys, 
for this person. I mean, and, and that's how business works. That's how right. business is supposed to work. You connect with as many people as you can and be genuine. You want to be exactly. genuine with what you're doing. I, yeah, and I think if you come across as offering a service um, versus trying to sell someone, it's like nobody wants to be sold, but people are willing to help you out. So one of the things, and I mean, um, Tammy Turner, our speaker in the fall, she is an expert at that. Um, so, you know, one of the things that you can ask people when you meet them, you introduce yourself and, you know, you, you say things like, is there anything that I can do to help you? And like, for in, you're in, uh, for you, for instance, they can say, oh, I'm not looking for a banker right now or, or you know, community relations manager. And then you, you're responsible to be like, OK, no problem. Great. Um, who else do you know who I can help? So that way you're presenting yourself as someone who's offering a service in the community versus someone who's just trying to, you know, out here selling or trying to peddle a product. And I just, to me, it just gives you, it's more of a soft sell approach. And it also just makes you so much more marketable than, you know, having that kind of used car salesperson <laughs> approach, which like people usually run away from. Yep. And I would say having that approach for me, especially now, that, that is something that, it blows me away. Um, you know, people that I, quite frankly, I forgot. Okay, well, let's go to commercial. Okay, we went to a quick commercial break. Marcus is back with us. Marcus, go ahead and finish your thought. I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I was talking about having a soft sales approach and oh, yes. a service in the community versus trying to sell someone a product. Yes, I was saying that just having that approach and not, not wanting to sound or be like a used car salesman, um, yeah. still having people that I never did business with because they remember that they said, oh, you know, I want to do business with you. Um, mm -hmm. One lady in particular, she said she wanted to get a loan and she was been trying for a couple of years and I finally got together. I'm going to do this with you because you've always been helpful. You've always been nice and you, you've helped me when it didn't necessarily serve you. And that's the thing, because it's not about me hitting my numbers and my goal. It's about serving the community. That's why I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. I have a passion to truly help them. Because exactly. I know by me me helping you get to where you need to be, that it will come back around to me. Whether you, if you work with someone else, I have faith that it will. And it always has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's the golden rule. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. Not necessarily Absolutely. the way you get treated sometimes, but the way that you want to be treated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I feel like that's some of the best... Um, Salespeople are like they're selling you something you don't even know that you've been sold. You're like, okay, I'll buy that, and you're like, wait a minute. I'd like, um, for instance, the the last car that I just purchased. It's my first new car, and I actually was just going to the dealership, but it was on a recall. And you know, the star said he actually was a used car salesperson. <laughs> he was. Um, I was at a Ford dealership, and so I was saying. Um, He's like, well, hi, how are you? I was like, hi. And he was, and we like made an instant connection, but I'm like, okay, I'm not here to buy a car. All right. I just came. It's a recall. I'm just coming to get the car repair and I'm leaving. But the deal was so good. I got like a two to three percent interest rate. I mean, I just got a phenomenal deal and I just couldn't um, pass it up. So like I said, he was actually an excellent uh, salesperson, but I feel like the best salespeople are the ones who you don't even know you're being sold something. They just are that good. So you just basically are having a conversation. And the next thing you look up, <laughs> you're like signing papers. You want, you want to be personable because it's something when I was um, in the training program early in my career, something someone said to me is people want to do business. They feel like they can have a beer with. 
Mm-hmm. If they don't, if they don't like you. If they don't trust you. They're not going to do business with you. Right. So it's important to be personable and be that likable person. Exactly. And salespeople are usually um, very much people persons. You know, if you meet someone in sales, it's like if you meet a pastor who doesn't like people, it's like uh, I think you're in the wrong profession. Yeah. <laughs> typically, it's very people. clear. Very clear. Yeah. Yeah. So. But that's a, another conversation for a different day. Absolutely. So, um, Marcus, thank you so much for being a guest on our show today. Um, we really enjoy having you. We're looking forward to getting some tidbits from some, some possible sales tidbits from you um, on uh, at the event next Friday with Kim Lee. We hope to see everyone else there as well. You can go to our website at dbhg.org. To purchase your tickets, tickets are only $30. So they are, there's actually a discount from the Shannon Steele event. If you are a member already at DBHG, tickets are $25. And if you become a member before the event, um, you have about a week and a half um, to become a member. You actually can attend the event for free. So our membership rates start at $125. Also, please subscribe to our channel. Um, for DBHG under Nancy O'Neill. And make sure that you click the bell for notifications. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Everybody have a great evening. We will see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye. All right.